function shows that the limit of 2x is 2, which of the following must be true? What does this tell you first? Before you even look at potential answers here, what is this right here? What is this telling you? Oh, that is the limit definition of derivative. That's telling you that f prime at of x, sorry, f prime of x at x equals what is what. It tells you something about the derivative of f, right? So it tells you f prime of 2 is equal to what? 0. So let's look at a. The a, the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 does not exist. Was that true? No. No. Because concretely, does it tell you that the limit exists? Yeah. The limit of f of x as x, oh, it doesn't say the derivative, does it, right? Oh, that's not, it's, it's, this is the derivative, not the function. F, for b, it says f is not defined at x equals 2. Um, here's the key thing. There's a really key word. What's the third word from the end there? Must, Must be true. This is really important oh. because some of these might be true some of the time. No but not all of the time. So for example, we know that the derivative of this function at x equals 2 is 0. Does it necessarily mean anything about the function itself? Do we know f of 2 is 0? No. So we definitely can get rid of that. Do we have any idea what the function value is at that point? No. Does it have to be continuous at x equals 0? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, because you could have a function that looks like this. It goes up and then continues, right? There could be a jump, right? Oh, f is continuous at x equals 0. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you have no idea what's going on at x equals 0. Right. So this one's gone. The derivative of f at x equals 2 is 0? Yeah. yeah. No, that's just the function. The de no, no. The derivative of f at x equals 2 is 0. This is the limit definition of derivative of the function f. So in... C, I think, is the answer. Yeah. yeah? Oh, 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 did I make a mistake? Zero. Zero. That is a super common mistake, not to kill the constant. What did I do twice here? I had to use the product rule on this, and I used the product rule on this. All I did was factor out the two. Derivative of x with respect to x is 1. The derivative of x with respect to y with respect to x is y prime. So how many y primes do you have right here? Wait, so... Oh. You have to use the product rule. And this one is x, treat x like it's a constant? You're differentiating with respect to x. You're treating, you're, you're treating each of these like they are functions. y is some function of x. That is what we're doing with implicit differentiation. We're assuming there is some function y, some function that you can write y as in terms of x. So when you differentiate it, it kicks out a, the derivative of y. This is dy dx right here. This, the ones, this is just dx dx. This one is just what? dx dx. You have to use the product rule on both of these right here. When you implicitly differentiate, you have to use the product rule when you have x and y together. It is super common for them to give you x times y. You are differentiating this whole thing with respect to x. dx dx is equal to what? Uh, and one. one. That's why there's a one right there, and that's why there's a one right there. Now at this point, do you need to solve for y prime? You don't have to. You don't have to. What can you do at this point? Just plug in. Plug in one for x and two for y. So you end up with 2 squared plus 1 times 2 times 2 y prime, right? Plus 2 times, what's y? 2 plus what? y prime, like this. And this is just, we just do algebra, right? This was B, if this was AB calculus, you think of it as x, f of x squared plus 2x, f of x squared equals 8. That's how I tell people to write it. It's just instead of y, what do you write? F of x. Now take the derivative. That's how I write it. That's when I first do it. But and then, then you plug in the exactly. Yeah. Correct. But the key thing is to save the key thing is to save time. Don't isolate y prime. Just plug in the values and then get y prime. If you actually do this, the oh, first. I see how to do this. Okay. So first of all, this is literally just okay. So that's okay. What is du going to be? One half dx. Correct. So what does dx equal? 2 du. 2 du. So you have to make all of these substitutions. So first you have to change the limits of integration, right? These are x values, correct? These are x values. So the new limits of integration, we know that u is equal to x over 2. So we're looking at the numbers 4 and 2 getting thrown into there for the x values, right? So instead, the integral now you know is definitely going to go from 1 to what? 1 to 2. So you can get rid of this immediately, and you can get rid of 
that immediately, correct? And then you end up with 1 minus u squared over x. And what is dx? dx. 2 du. 2 du? Yeah. Like this? Yeah. Now the real So we still have that x in the denominator. How do you get rid of that? You multiply both sides by 2 d, so you get x equals 2 u. True. Or you just take this and you know that, yeah, 2 u is equal. Yeah, that's what you said. 2 u is equal to x. So you end up with 1 to 2 of 1 minus u squared over 2 u times what? 2 du. Yeah. What cancels? So you end up with 1 to 2 of 1 minus u squared over u du. Is that one of the answers? Yeah. yeah. And which one is it? First one? There it is. Cool. I think we did. You apply L'Hopital's rule, but what are you doing it on? You're doing it specifically on numerator and then specifically on the denominator. So what's the derivative of the top going to be? What it careful careful be really really careful So you have to so L'Hopital's rule says if you have an indeterminate form you have a quotient That's zero over zero or infinity over infinity You can differentiate the top you can differentiate the bottom and the limit of the new quotient will equal the limit of the old one Right, mm -hmm. so we're specifically doing the limit as h goes to zero of the derivative of this thing right here how do we do that? You caught, the, you caught it. So it's going to be the it's going to be the square root mm -hmm, of what? One plus h to the plus. Do, do you have to like do the chain rule or anything? No, because when you differentiate an integral, essentially what's going on? They obliterate each other, right? But the key thing is there are two things to realize when you're applying the FTC. It doesn't matter what the bottom limit of integration is. It has to be a constant. But whatever it is up top, that replaces the value inside the function. So instead of x to the fifth, we have 1 plus h to the, to the fifth. If that was, and we would have to differentiate, we actually are using the chain rule. What's it being multiplied by? 1. How is that 1? It's 1 because you're differentiating, you're differentiating 1 plus h. 1, yes. You treat it as such, yes. So then what's go, what goes on the bottom? One. 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 Now at this point, can you just plug in zero? Yes. Yeah, so you're doing the limit as h goes to zero. You just plug it in. It's going to be the square root of? Nine. Nine, so it's going to be three. I think the answer is C. Is that it? Yeah. Does that make sense, everybody? What's the really nice thing that they do give you on this, at least? They give you the interval. Sometimes they don't give you the interval, and you have to figure it out without a graph, and that can kind of be annoying because you don't know where where it intersects the first time, because how many times do polar graphs intersect each other? Like a trillion, they keep on going, right? By definition, they're cyclical. So you're like, man, where's the pedal? I don't know, and I have nightmares about roses now. Um, <laughs> so you just need to remember the form for polar integration. Do you remember what it is? One half the integral. Of One half the integral from zero to pi over two of what? R squared. R squared d theta, right? And do we have R? No. Yeah, so the, the trick on this one, is going to be the fact that you're going to have sine squared 2 theta d theta. The trick is you have to integrate that. Again, this is 1985, so there ain't no calculator on this question, right? Um, do you remember how you integrate sine squared? Uh, 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 you could use... Yeah, uh, Can you do parts? Is there a substitution? I think you do the half angle substitution thing, right? Yeah. You can't do that, like one but minus. Minus. Yeah, there's a substitution that really helps. Yeah. That's the most common method that I remember. I can never remember what the proper substitution is. And yes, I just went on record as saying that. Yeah. I think we can, right? Mm -hmm. It's because you end up with 2 sine squared 2 theta is equal to 1 minus cosine of 4 theta, right? So yeah, I know. So I'm, I'm just doing it out too many steps. I know. This right here is equal to 1 minus cosine of 4 theta all over 2. And now can we substitute that in? Yes. I think we can. I think this is okay. <laughs> is it horrible? What is it? This is one half minus one half uh, cosine of what? Four theta. Four theta. Let's factor out the one half. It doesn't really matter, right? But is this integrable? Yeah. Well, reasonably, more, much more reasonable one. Yeah. I think it is, and this is where we'll actually do it out just to practice it once. Um, if we actually do this integration. Um, you end up with, well, you end up with, you can do this, 1 half of 0 to 1 half of 1 half d theta, right? Minus 1 fourth of 0 to pi over 2 of 
cosine four theta d theta. Yeah. Is that? How do you get? What, um, let me just keep going here. For the boundary of the first integral, is it? It doesn't tell us it, right? It just tells us right here. Is it pi over two instead of one over two? Oh, did I change it to one over two? That's a mistake. Yes, it should be pi over two. Correct. So then, what do you get here? You get one fourth of pi over two minus zero, right? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Minus one fourth of the integral of cosine four theta. So that's going to be one fourth sine. Is it one fourth sine of four theta? Yeah. yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. From zero to what? Okay, so you end up with pi over 8 minus 1 16th of sine of 2 pi minus sine of 0. Not null, sine of sine of 0, right? <laughs> this is where I hope we don't make a small mistake. Pi over, yeah, you could. Uh, what sine of, yeah, what sine of 2 pi? 0, right? Yeah. And this is just 0, so we think it's pi over 8. And this is where we're like, please, 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 no. Yay! And then you're like, I don't have the time to check any of the other answers, and you move on, okay? Is that the right answer? Yeah, it is. Woo! <laughs> All right, and I'm done. I quit. I'm done. Okay. Um, <laughs> anybody have another one to talk about? The problem with this one was that this 1 over n corresponds to the width, right? The width of each piece. But the problem was, we know it goes from 1 to 3, right? Because as n goes to infinity, 3 over n goes to 3, 1 over n goes to 0, right? So we know our interval in integration is going from 0 to 3. Are you with me so far? Yes. But, the width of, but if you break up, if you break up 0 to 3 into n pieces, what's the width of each piece? Infinitesimal. 3 over n, no, yes, but that 3 over n, okay? If you go, look, from 0 to 3 and you have n intervals, what's the width of each one? 3 over, yes, but specifically 3 over n. Are we with, with me so far? So the challenge here was what we noticed at the end was that something seemed to be weird here because we're, there's instead of the width being 3 over n, what is it? One it's 1 over n. So I thought originally, oh, they just did a multiple of it, but they didn't. How many numbers are here? This is where the key came, thing came into play. This is what Ty noticed here. There's 1 over n, then 2 over n, then 3 over n, then 4 over n, and then it goes all the way up to yeah. 3 over 3 n. Over, 3 n of them, right? Yeah. So how many intervals did it get chopped into? N intervals. 3, three n, n intervals. intervals. Yeah. Be very specific three with your language here. 0 to 3 got chopped up into 3, three n, n intervals, okay? Yeah. Watch this. If there's 3 n, oh, three if there's three n intervals, look, if there's 3 n intervals, and each one of them one is 1 over n, that's the same thing as n intervals, right, that are, what do you get in both cases? Three. What's 3n three over times 1 over n? Oh, okay. What's n times 3n over n? Oh, no, sorry. 3 over n. <laughs> sorry, sorry. There's an extra n in there. Sorry. Whoa. I can't erase all of a sudden. Do you see this product right here? What's 3n times 1 over n? 3. This is the same product. The idea is, instead of having n intervals that are all 3n wide, they did 3n intervals that are all 1 over n wide. It was, and you're going to infinity, so they're all getting infinitesimally small, so they're equivalent. They're equivalent. The nasty thing here is that usually when you do a Riemann sum, how many intervals do you break your interval into? N of them, right? You did that a ton of times. You remember when you did those limits and you're like, oh, I don't like integration. And then they showed you how to do an integral and you're like, oh, I don't have to do or even sums anymore. Most of the time, they break it into N intervals. As a side note to this, we like even intervals, right? Because it makes our algebra like out of possible, right? Technically speaking, do Riemann sums work even if we have different sized intervals? Yes, as long as we break it up into an infinite number of subintervals that get infinitesimally small, it doesn't have to be consistent, but it makes the algebra impossible. So to make things clean, to make things nice, they work with n intervals that are b minus a over n, right? 0 to 3, three so 3 over n. But the key thing is <laughs> they massaged it. So yes, there are more intervals. There's 3 n intervals, but the width of each interval is just 1 over n. Or, if they wanted to do it the exact same thing, they could have made it n intervals in the width be 3 over n. They go to infinity at the same, like they go to the same place. 
They go to the same place. This just means that there's no multiplier out front. This just is. So therefore, which is the answer to this? It's definitely D right here. We knew automatically, hold on, you should easily be able to eliminate this one, this one, and this one, right? Because you, you notice that the function that's working on is the squared function. This is just the piece, so you automatically get rid of these. And the key thing here is when we got to this, the inconsistency, I wanted to lean towards this because I thought we needed to multiply it by three, but the thing is that's the wrong direction. Exactly, by one third. It's like, where's the one third? It's not there. Yeah. Oh, there's a problem. Oh, the, the concept all comes down to this right here. This is what, I think we wrote this on the board right as you guys left, or I wrote that down. And I was like, oh, okay, it's the same thing. That being said, I guess the key piece on this one is the following. The higher the numbers, the harder they get. So when you get to like 40 plus, be very careful. Be very careful. This was this was this tricked me. I thought this was a straightforward because they have ones that look just like this in the first 10. And there's no trick to it. It's n intervals, there's the right thing. They didn't shift anything around. Anything else?